Um, thank you for joining the tech download and this session. Um, before we start, I'm just going to go over the event guidelines. Um, so the video, this video will be recorded. Uh, you will not appear on the video, but we will, uh, except when we turn off our camera. Uh, please, we, the audio will be muted during this event for you folks. Um, but if you do have questions, just submit that in the Q and A. Um, we are always looking at the comments in the chat, but questions that we'll be answering at the end, we look at the Q and A feature to pull them. So make sure you put that there. Uh, our closed captioning is available for folks that need it. Turn it on, just click on the live cap gift icon at the bottom of your screen. That note, we're gonna go next. Uh, for the person that asked me where in uh, Jersey, Jersey City. Um, all right. All right, so here's a quick recap of the agenda. Uh, we're gonna go through a quick round of introductions and we're gonna do a deep dive uh, into search discovery and testing and meetup and what that means for us, as well as a final round of Q and A. So I'm gonna start with the quick introductions here. Uh, I'll introduce the, the other folks that are gonna be speaking. My name is Rajiv Ahmed, I'm the CTO at Meetup. Um, we also have Sach S, who's the VP of Data and ML, and we have Verna Singh, who's the Senior Director of uh, Product. Uh, on that note, I'm gonna jump. We have a very packed agenda today, so I wanna make sure we can cover everything and give everyone time to answer, uh, ask their questions for us to be able to answer them. So I'm gonna go really quickly. So data infrastructure. Um, there's a lot of things I'm going to really cover, but data sits at the core of our platform. Um, we use data to make all of our decisions. It helps us evolve our products while ensuring that the satisfaction is there from our community. We don't just release features. If we, we test them, we make sure that they are actually um, giving meaningful value, and then we actually release it out. I think Bernard is going to be talking about this in the later on our slide, uh, but data really sits at the core of every decision we make. Um, we personalize for meaningful experiences for all of our users. Uh, we've built really proprietary algorithms to look at search, discovery, uh, and ensure that we allow our community and members to really find events that they're looking for. And we've shifted in moving into real-time recommendations and decision-making um, versus things that would be slow. So we wanna make impacts fast. We wanna make sure that discovery uh, is right at your fingertips and we're shifting our technology to be able to do that. So uh, some fun facts. Um, we have 850 terabytes uh, in our data lake. It's a huge amount of data that uh, we have that we extract insights from that allow us to really personalize and really make, evolve our products to really make sure that they can uh, be meaningful for each person. Um, we have roughly one terabyte of data that comes through our system on a daily basis and of almost 750 gigs of data that we process daily. Uh, and these numbers will not shrink, they will just go up and up. So uh, it's a huge, huge uh, kudos to our data team that supports this large system. Uh, we play with a lot of big data technologies and I'm gonna go through a little bit over that in my next slide. However, I'm not gonna get too technical, just a very high level overview. But if you do have questions, you can uh, put them in the chat for later because we have Satch here who can uh, at a high level answer them later on. Um, so our meetup infrastructure at a glance, uh, we basically have a mechanism to ingest all of our system. And the general overview is we ingest our system, we ingest our data, we transform our data so we can make it meaningful. So uh, make it structured so we can actually use it and then feed it back into our main applications that will allow it to really uh, make real-time decisions in our products that we uh, surface to you. So uh, at a high level, you know, things that are coming in from our clients and our apps is coming through API gateway. It's feeding through all into our backend system. Our backend systems use this technology such as EMR, data pipelines, and extracts all our system data and our learnings and pushes it over into uh, a structured data that we can then leverage. That goes into a state where we are able to analyze, we are able to make, uh, ask really good questions of how we want to use. At the same time, Satya's team builds out these wonderful data services that we can take the data into, feed it into a system that can learn, and ultimately then push back into uh, results that users will face. Um, I'm going to push this over to Satch, who will actually now talk about how that data touches the user experience and makes it, makes it better for you all. Go ahead, Saj. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Uh, so Rajiv just uh, mentioned, you know, all this data and this data infrastructure. So how do we use all that to improve the user experience? Um, so I'm, I'm broadly going to talk about two ways. One is search and the other is uh, personalization. So in search, 
um, the next slide. Uh, why search? Why is search a focus? Uh, so the next slide. Um, search is really core to what Meetup does, uh, matching customer demand uh, with our supply of groups and events uh, and what to, to what our members are looking for. This is really core to delivering on the value of Meetup. And search is the key tool for doing this, especially when a user knows, knows what they're looking for, right? Um, if anyone uh, remembers our old search experience, uh, you might remember it because um, some of you may still be experiencing it. Um, oftentimes users just wouldn't be able to find what they were looking for. And so we embarked uh, a year ago on a process of revitalizing and revamping our search infrastructure and modernizing it. So on the next slide, you can see just a, a, a brief overview of the architecture that we're using today for that these new search services. At its core sits Elasticsearch, which is the database where documents sit that are queried and you know bring up the search results. And so that's kind of this is kind of a, a, a glance at, at how that magic happens. All right. So on the next slide, um, I'm going to take a brief for uh, like brief voyage into uh, how people are using search today. Um, so what are folks searching for? Um, this is a query of just the past couple of days um, about you know what what our users are are searching for. So based on the volume of searches by query string, you know you see things like friends, hiking, a lot of sports, and of course pickleball, um, which is number 29 in the list. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, friends, let's focus on friends. So, I think we're at a moment in time where you know uh, a lot of people are coming out of the pandemic and thinking about making connections. So it makes a lot of sense. And there, uh, you know, in the next few slides, you can see there's been a lot of um, articles about um, about finding friends and and referencing Meetup as a great tool for doing that. And we've also made it easier on our platform uh, to find. Uh, to kind of search for friends. And you can see that in the next slide. There, circle in red, make new friends. Um, so it's certainly a focus um, and certainly what, what people are very interested in. It's, it's very interesting to see that huge, huge increase in volume. Um, on the next slide, it's just a glance at um, where across the world we see a lot of search volume. So again, just in the few, few, last few days, people all over the globe are searching or using Meetup to search for events and groups. Okay, so let's let's go um, into some of the improvements that we've made um, to search uh, across the platform. So first on the next slide um, are, you know, are, are changes we've done to um, filtering search results. So the first kind of thing we've done is highlighting uh, happening now or starting soon. These are events that, you know, are things that you can hop into immediately. Uh, things like uh, a, a prevalence of online events now make this really possible. So uh, if our users just hit the site and are looking for something specific and that thing is happening right then, they can, you know, they don't have, they no longer have to travel and make arrangements to go to it in real life. They, you can actually start um, viewing things immediately. So we've made that more prevalent by adding uh, a temporal filter for that. The next change we've made is uh, adding, adding more filters for uh, the category of events and uh, adding the ability to sort results by date, which is a, something that um, a lot of users were requesting. And then on the next, um, just referencing uh, these quick search buttons that we've added to the homepage. So this is uh, you know, an easy way to kind of click directly into what you're looking for. All right, and the next, um, uh, you know, mostly I've been talking about event search. We've also added group search. Um, and so this is again, utilizing this new architecture uh, to, to surface groups um, that folks are looking for. So we've added that, it's a, a new tab in, in, on that uh, search page. And we've also, um, you know, 
Previously, uh, when you didn't add a search uh, keyword, you would have an empty screen. So we've added a default list of uh, groups that are based on you know, locally popular groups. And then the third is something that we're currently testing. So we are actively iterating on the algorithms uh, for search and uh, you know, the, they're being tested currently and they'll, they'll launch soon. Okay, so that's search. Um, we also do a lot of uh, personalization. And uh, what does that look like? So for the most part, we're talking about recommendations. And the way we think about recommendations is kind of by a user's journey with Meetup. So for our guests, we, we don't really know much about their interests. Uh, so we, we tend to um, put recommendations in front of them that are based on things that are popular in the location uh, that they're, they're in. Uh, for our newest users who kind of are just uh, going through the registration and onboarding flow, we, we're starting to, to know a little bit about what they like because they're selecting topics of interest. So that's kind of at the core of how we can um, show them uh, events and groups that interest them. And then for exist, our existing users, they've told us what they're interested in and they've also shown us what they're interested in. So when, when you RSVP to an event, we know, hey, you like that event. Um, this is, you can think about it like Netflix does you watch movies uh, of a certain type, you'll probably get recommendations of that type. So that's kind of how that goes. So on the next slide, I'm gonna go into a little detail about um, recommendations for guests. So this is an example at the bottom, events near New York, New York, New York. Um, and these are really listed by popularity. So again, for somebody who just lands on our homepage and is not a registered user or is logged out, our best guess is to show them things that are popular um, and, and it does drive a lot of traffic, so it's great. On the next page um, is a focus on recommendations for new users. And earlier, Rajib referenced this real-time architecture that we're moving towards um, for recommendations. This is where we really start to utilize it. Um, you can see in these uh, snapshots uh, you know, when you go through an onboarding flow, you'll pick uh, categories of interest, then hone in on topics of interest. By that point, um, we can start to use that information to put the right groups and events in front of you. And that's sort of how that, that process works. And then next slide um, is our, you know, a framework for our recommendations for existing users. So for our active members, we, we use the, their interests and their RSVPing activity to find the best events. And you can see that here. So um, when, we, when we have uh, recommendations for users, we'll put them in there. When we don't have enough, we fall back to you know, things that are popular and, and uh, things like that. So uh, I'm gonna hand it over uh, to Perna to talk about testing and experimentation. Cool, thanks Satch. Um, hi everybody. Um, so you just heard Satch talk about how we leverage data to personalize the experience for our members and our organizers and how we use it to make better recommendations. Um, but I want to also get into how we can use data to make better, more informed product and business decisions. Next slide, Rajiv. So testing and experimenting are really powerful tools when we leverage them appropriately. It allows us one, to directly measure the impact of our work. We wanna know what works and what doesn't work in terms of both driving business and customer impact. And a test allows us to do this in a manner that removes ambiguity and helps us determine causation. Second, testing allows us to learn pretty quickly and fail fast if we realize it's not going so well. Um, we have a lot of ideas of what we could be doing at any given point in time. And for most of those ideas, we don't always have all of the information we need to validate if it's a good idea or not. So we turn to experimenting a concept or a version of that idea so that we can get more information pretty cheaply and quickly without investing a ton of resources to get that learning. And third, we test and experiment so that when we release a new feature or change the user experience in some way, we can ensure that we're not adversely impacting something about our core ecosystem. 
So maybe something like a small change we might have made to an algorithm may end up adversely impacting our new members. If we don't run that as a test, it'd be really hard to pinpoint where we, that, that the specific change would have um, sort of caused that issue. And the issue might itself might have gone like unrecognized for many months if we don't run this as a test. So in those cases, when we test, we're able to really quickly and deliberately make changes where we see things aren't going well. And ultimately, we just test because it helps us build a really better meetup. So I wanna talk on the next slide about how we actually do it. One of the tools that we use for testing um, is this split testing methodology. Um, split testing is a controlled method that allows us to look at lots of different scenarios and variations, and it helps us understand what the outcomes would be in each of those scenarios by assigning participants randomly to each scenario and serving those scenarios like over and over again um, uh, until we're confident about the results. Uh, the part that I really want to highlight is, is the part where we talked about randomly assigning people. The random part's really important. We want to make sure that the sample of participants that are getting enrolled in each of these scenarios are representative of the whole population so that we reduce any unknown or confounding variables in our analysis. Um, on the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about uh, when it makes sense to, uh, to do this and, and, and how we want to be strategic about uh, how we run these tests and ensuring ultimately that we're measuring what really matters. Not everything that we do requires a split test and testing itself actually does come with some downsides, especially when we're looking at it from like a time and resources perspective. So we use this framework that you see here on the screen um, to think through all of the different considerations and be really intentional about what we're hoping to learn. Um, there's three core components to this framework. So the first one is what is the actual product change that we're making? Can we define that and articulate that very clearly? Second, what's the impact to our business? Like we need to be able to know and be able to look at a very specific metric in order to know if we're successful or not. And third, what do we hope to learn? Um, what is like the most critical assumption we have made in building this feature so that we can further our learning in this area? So this is very critical to um, understand being able to describe our hypothesis. So I'll talk a little bit about how we use this framework um, and, and show you some examples of tests that we've run in the, um, in the past. But um, in the next slide, I wanna talk a little bit about, um, you know, I kind of briefly mentioned that split testing isn't right for every scenario. So we use this sort of general guideline to determine when it's appropriate to split test. And that includes anytime we're launching a new product feature or we're making product improvements, or just making some changes to the user experience. Um, on the next slide, to give you an idea of how much we test and experiment at Meetup, in 2020, we conducted over 50 split tests in, um, over the course of the year, which roughly translates to almost a test a week. And through these tests, we've enrolled more than 100 million members and organizers and site visitors in our experiments. So if you've been on our site or our apps at any given point um, over the course of the last year, chances are pretty high that you've been a subject in one of our many ongoing experiments. So I wanna show you a couple examples of split tests that we've done in the past few months. Um, so the first one I wanna discuss is a UX change that we made. Um, we saw in the behavioral data that new organizers weren't creating their first event at the same rate compared to more tenured organizers who were scheduling events. And our hypothesis was that uh, we thought it wasn't clear maybe to new organizers what they should do next after they set up their group. So we introduced this banner that you see, it's pretty small on your screen. Um, and a much clearer call to action to prompt organizers to create their first event and helping and indicating like what the benefits of doing so would be, i.e. more people would join their group after their first event would be scheduled, which is an outcome that everybody wants. Um, our expectation with you know, releasing this particular feature was that not only would more events be scheduled, but we'd also see an uptick in RSVPs because there'd just be more events to go to. 
And this test confirmed that hypothesis. We saw a significant increase in both groups and events scheduled, um, as well as a pretty nice boost in RSVPs that directly resulted from those new events that got created that wouldn't have been created before that banner. On the next slide, um, Satch kind of briefly touched upon happening now, but I wanted to share that, you know, we ran a split test on this new feature. Um, and and we, we did this because we wanted to see how we could enhance our event discovery by adding some of these really relevant features, those blue pills that you see on the screen. Um, and when we ran this as a split test, we saw an increase in registrations and specifically activated registrations. Those are people who have RSVP'd within 12 hours of registering. From a product perspective, this actually gives us a lot of insight into how we can be doing a much better job of assisting users to find things that match their intent rather than trying to have to formulate what they're looking for in a search bar. So in other words, it's way easier to click on something that looks way more interesting than actually trying to figure out what to type in search. So we're spending a lot more time here as a product team to think about how we can do a better job in serving our members and our organizers. And then lastly, I want to share results from a split test. Uh, next slide. Uh, where we were proven differently than what our original hypothesis was. Turns out you can't always get it right. Um, and so what we thought was based on, we, we thought that what we had heard from organizers and our members was that the most important factor in deciding which events to RSVP to was based on date and specifically availability. So when we introduced this like sort by date feature, we thought that the default order for how we show event results should be in chronological order. And when we ran this as a split test, it actually turned out that the opposite was true. Um, and it turns out that people want to see things that match their interests before they filter things they can actually go to and attend. So the takeaway for us as a product team is it's really about trying to find the right balance between showing the most relevant content in the chronological order. And we factored this insight actually into a lot of product decisions that we've made recently. So this is how learning, experimentation and testing can continue to elevate the kind of decisions that we make as a product team. Um, but sometimes numbers, uh, sometimes numbers tell us, uh, tell a very compelling story, but they don't always tell us everything. And really, I think it's like, and art and science to all of this. Um, and to help us build a really complete narrative of what's going on, we have to look to various sources of data and input um, to tell us more about why something is happening and not just the what, which is what um, some of the data, the split testing data has uh, can tell us. So I wanna share a really quick but powerful example of how we've leveraged and married both the quantitative and qualitative data to guide our product decisions. And that's really evidenced in the evolution of our homepage, which is what you see in front of you. Um, so what you see in front of you are three versions of our homepage. Um, for most people, it's what you see on the far left, that's design one. Um, and quite honestly, it's actually pretty much how it's looked for like the better half of a decade. Um, but for some folks, uh, they've started seeing version two, um, which is the design in the middle. Um, it's a design that we started rolling out to new members in the fall of 2020. And we rolled out and split tested with more tenured members in the winter. And design three, well, that is actually the product of a lot of testing and, a re and research that we've been doing with our organizers and our members to fully understand and design for the needs of our customers. Um, I wanna talk about on the next slide, um, the journey that it's been to get here. Um, as I mentioned, we started split testing design two in late 2020. Um, we actually saw some positive movements in terms of our key metrics from the split testing. But when we asked for qualitative feedback from a survey of more tenured and uh, tenured organizers and members, we got a lot of suggestions and feedback on how we were missing the mark. And so we followed that up with some more in-person research to get information that you just simply can't derive from analyzing the results of a split test. And so we conducted 
numerous interviews with organizers and members in the last few months. Um, and we've also been taking the time to analyze a lot of uh, the behavioral cohort data because um, now we have like six months of it to arrive at to basically what you're seeing um, in front of you, which is the design that we're working on implementing right now. Um, we're really excited to bring this homepage to you. Uh, one thing to note, the thing that you're seeing on the right, these designs, it's obviously a very dramatic facelift from what we have today for most of our users. There's also a lot of under the hood changes that we've made, specifically all of the changes that SAS just described to our search and recommendations and all of the powerful engines that we've been building are all happening on this new design. So we're super excited uh, to roll out this version in the next month or so and start to get your feedback because we really hope that um, it meets more of your needs. Um, so that's it for uh, a lot of the search and data stuff, but as you can see, um, all of the work that you saw today, it honestly takes a village. Um, we have an amazing team of engineers, data scientists, product, uh, product managers, designers, like the list goes on and on. Um, and so we're super excited to um, continue building, but obviously this can't happen without also your support. Um, so on the next slide, um, if you're looking to get involved, we're always looking for more organizers and members to speak to. Um, if you use that link to sign up, um, you'll be one of the first to see new designs, provide directions on new concepts that we're exploring, and just overall be a really critical part in making our platform better. So please sign up um, using that form. I think we'll also drop the link in the comments so you can click and save and fill it out um, when you have time. Um, another big component of building Meetup is hiring great people to work here. Uh, we have several roles um, across engineering and data science. Um, and you can check them out at our careers page that's on the screen. And I think we'll, we'll drop those in the link as well in the chat. And if you have any questions about our team, our culture, whatever, um, we have our contact information on the last slide. So definitely please feel free to reach out to us. And then um, I'll just make a personal pitch. Uh, one of the most rewarding parts of the Meetup platform for me um, has been actually being an organizer. Um, and organizers are the backbone of Meetup. So if you're interested in trying it out, uh, there's never been a better time. We have a special discount, 50% off your first subscription. Um, so use that link um, to get your uh, discount. And I think we'll drop it also in the chat. And lastly, we have a podcast. Some of you might have already heard about it um, or heard it, um, but it's called Keep Connected. It's hosted by our CEO, David Siegel. Uh, David covers lots of different topics around community, relationships, and just um, his own insights from building Meetup. So check it out. Um, you can subscribe at that link or use the QR code. Um, I'll pause a couple seconds for you to do that. And that's it. Um, Here's our contact information as promised. If you have any questions, feedback, or you just wanna learn a little bit more about our teams, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, we'll also be taking questions now. So thank you for joining and listening today. We're super, super grateful to have this opportunity to share our progress with you. All right, thanks everyone for joining. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can start the Q&A. All right. All right, Sats, this question I think is uh, coming from Christina and it's, it's a very, um, it's a perfect question for you. In addition to using Elasticsearch, have you considered using a time series database in, into the mix like TimeStream uh, or InfluxDB? Once you start adding a temporal element into your search component, the analysis behind these metrics get much stronger if you add time series. Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Um, we do currently use time um, when we, we talk about our search functionality. So in Elasticsearch itself, we have uh, basically a temporal decay. So um, when you think about uh, search relevance and somebody looks for something like soccer, we want to, we want to make sure that we're um, putting soccer events that are happening in the next week 
above those that are happening next month or the month after. And so we do, we do definitely do take time into account. It is interesting. I'm sure there's a lot more to do in terms of analyzing results and looking, uh, looking at time is a big component of that. So. Great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, a anonymous person asked, can you talk about geography in search? Yeah, so uh, pretty much the same, uh, same deal. When, when we think about search relevance uh, and you enter that, that keyword like soccer, we also wanna show, uh, we wanna preference uh, the, the events that are closer to you in space as well as time. And so distance does play a key part. Um, and so the exact same uh, event at the same time, uh, but at slightly different locations that we will preference the one that's closer to your purported lo location. So, uh, There's a question from Rob C. He said, what percentage of people are using desktop versus mobile? And by mobile, I'm guessing you mean the apps um, and not mobile web. But in any case, um, if you look at just mobile usage, usage on a mobile device, I think it's probably around, of our active members, it's probably around 65 to 70% are on a mobile device. Um, and, and a big component of that is our native app. So um, certainly it's, it's, it's a huge part of the user experience. Thanks, Alex. The one thing I'll add there, uh, Berna, correct me if I'm wrong, is that there is a lot of hybrid experiences too. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, they're, joining a group on their mobile app, they're you know, RSVPing for the event that they're gonna show up on, but then they switch to desktop uh, for many of the online events because um, they're happening online. Yeah. Um, so there is a huge overlap that um, also should be noted. Yeah, that's right. It's a pretty continuous experience between web and mobile. Um, and I think especially with COVID too, I think um, it, it's been less on the go because we've all been stuck in our homes. And so we've definitely seen um, higher desktop usage um, as a result of that. Uh, Fern, I think this question is for you. Uh, Sheila said, I'm interested in events on certain topics, regardless of where they are in the world. Uh, I've found it's been a challenge to find events even when I know the name and location because the current app insists on showing me um, you know, meetings that are in my local area. Uh, will the new version cover this? Yeah, um, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about um, online events and we we've, we have the online events um, filter. So you should be able to look through and find, um, find events uh, by just using that filter alone. Um, but we've also had, and we have taken a much more broader and holistic look um, at how we think about um, uh, both online and in-person events, especially as things are starting to open up now um, as well. And we expect that um, organizers are probably going to start um, hosting hybrid events, which are events that you host both in-person as well as um, online. And so um, our current product thinking has definitely been evolving for that. So you should be seeing a lot more changes coming on the new platform that I shared earlier um, that really sort of speak to that. Um, another question we have is regarding new features, can you speak to how they are rolled out on a country basis? Example, US first and maybe Canada, how quickly would a new feature go beyond the United States? Uh, that's a great question. Um, truth be told, we haven't been great um, at being able to roll out things internationally. We are changing this. So um, I think we did definitely take a little bit more of a US centric approach or, or not even just US, an English based approach um, and then rolling it out to um, international users. And um, one thing that uh, has been definitely a, a change on our product team has been moving um, a lot quicker to release internationally. Um, and we, we really believe that uh, we, we have a lot that we can be learning by releasing um, to our, our international users. Um, so expect to see that a lot of these features that I talked about today um, and that Satch talked about um, are, are coming to our international customers very soon. Um, we have about two, three more questions. Uh, this one I can take. Gary asked, do we have dark mode coming up? Uh, yes, on our apps, we already released the dark mode. Uh, I think in the settings, if you shift it and um, based on how you have it set up, it will kick in. Um, we do not have a dark mode plan for our website. Um, unless, unless, Berna, you, you came up with one. I'm not sure that we've uh, talked about that, but for the apps, it's already out. 
Um, the next question I have from Mary is, what about online events? Seems that you're focused only on geographical matching of groups and users. Um, well, uh, I can take that one. Um, Saatch, you can jump in if, if you want to add anything. Uh, for online events, I mean, we do look at uh, geography a bit different uh, because we know that plays a big factor in the results. Um, so basically for online events versus, uh, if you're using that filter in the search versus for general search, we do look at the results uh, coming back in a different way. Yeah, so in essence, um, for online ev events, uh, you'll, you'll get online events in your search results that are further out in space, um, just because, you know, we do, we do treat them a little bit differently in terms of geography. Um, I'm going to skip to another question because I think it's, it's, uh, matches. Um, someone said, if I keep getting irrelevant meetups suggested to me, uh, in addition to the ones I like, is there a way to tag them that I'm not interested? Uh, is that coming and that can, can that be put in as a feature? Yeah, so we did have some uh, functionality like that in uh, the older uh, web pages. We, we are thinking about it. Um, there's no specific plan for uh, this quarter, but it is something that we're aware of and, and we're trying to fit into our plans. Great. Um, I think we are going to wrap up with the last question now. Um, and this is what determines a popular group? Oh, one more after this, because we have one more that just came in. Uh, popular group. So um, again, um, recency. So how close in time it is. Uh, proximity. So how close in space it is. And also quality. And quality is really a, a popularity metric based on how many people are RCPing and visiting that event on the, on the web and the apps. Great, thank you, Saj. Um, the last question we have is, as an organizer, what I really would appreciate is not just better searches, um, but a way to promote my group to new people to encourage them to join. At the moment, there's no way for the organizers to do that. Um, unless new members actually do a search for a new group, and they won't see it. Also a way a group and individual messages via the app and the website so they can be received and read in the app and on the websites. What steps are being taken to do this and when can we expect these improvements? Um, so I think the gist of the question is, if, is um, you know, when you're creating the new groups, the discovery of that and how is that exposed uh, across our different, across our platform? Yeah, so- We're looking there to really improve. So um, search isn't the only way that um, people uh, users find content on Meetup. Um, Perna showed uh, some of our pages where we put um, forward um, popular events, events that hew to certain categories of interest, things like that. And certainly as users, uh, like I referenced, as, as users become uh, active users and, and longstanding users, we know more about uh, their own preference and put those in front of them. So. Um, if, if an event uh, matches their interest, we try, to, we try to promote it. The other thing I will add is that um, on an organizer side, a couple of examples that we showed today too, again, and thinking a little bit more about um, the scoring and whatnot, uh, it really actually depends on group activity. So if you're an organizer, the more events that you're creating, um, the more activity that you have, um, it, it really does help uh, elevate the group. Um, but I totally agree that the, the feedback itself is very fair and, and definitely an area that um, as a product team, we've, we've talked a lot about and we wanna make sure we're, we're serving our organizers in the best way possible. So uh, duly noted and, and we'll be back with some additional uh, thoughts around that. Okay. Um, so we had some last minute questions coming in. So I will, because we have the time, I will uh, share them. Uh, will Meetup's customer service uh, slash support become more data-driven. Example, there needs to be a different, stronger, faster, savior response to an organizer with 10,000 numbers versus um, a smaller group. So uh, I can take parts of this question. Um, our comics team, we call them Comex, uh, that supports the customer support. Uh, they're actually, they are very data-driven. Um, we do make sure that we treat, or, treat all of our organizers with the time that they need. Um, we, we know that there are some things that have different levels that uh, get immediate attention versus the others, but we always make it 
our intention to be able to solve problems for all of our organizers. Um, so we will continue to always look at where we can be efficient and improve, not just on the comics team, but across engineering, across product, and as an organization. Um, but Rob, thank you for asking this question. We will we will take some of this back and try to improve as we go. Um, next question: uh, Is there going to be a hybrid logo, like there is an online or an on-site logo? Sorry, is the question about a, a logo? Uh, yes, hybrid logo. Is there going to be a hybrid logo for online um, or on-site? I guess they're saying if and. Okay, now I got the question. Uh, I think the question being asked is when we do a search and the results come back, when something is in person, in yeah. real life, uh, attendance versus just online or hybrid, um, is there going to be something that differentiates it from a, um, from a visual perspective? Yeah, great question. Um, we're literally talking about hybrid events right now and how we're going to support um, being able to make sure that organizers can both uh, have a physical location as well as a like a Zoom link or whatnot. So um, definitely part of the discussion is how we can make sure that that's easily uh, denoted in the UI and as well as um, making that easily discoverable in the UX. So great question. Uh, there's definitely more to come here. Yeah, great. Um, so we are gonna be wrapping up now. That was our last question. I wanted to say thank you to uh, everyone that joined today. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, our great leaders, Sach and Berna for, um, coming to the session and coming to future tech sessions where they can talk about um, more things. But uh, this was a great event. If you have more questions, uh, please uh, reach out to us and we'll try to answer them as fast as we can. Don't forget to post comments on our Meetup Live page uh, under this event. Thank you everyone and uh, we will see you soon. Thanks everybody. Thanks.